and welcome everybody here in Twitch chat and everybody on YouTube for a special video. We are going to be talking about all of the new champions that are going to be entering Legends of Runeterra tomorrow for the Empires of the Ascended expansion. We're going to have a new region, Shirima, um, that's going to be coming up. And uh, the very last of the nine new champions was just revealed a little while ago. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go ahead and discuss all of the new champions, and we're going to put them in a tier list, um, S, A, B, or C, for a different tier list for each one. So we're going to go ahead and start with Renekton, because Renekton was the first champion previewed, and we'll just kind of go by um, when they were previewed, and we'll kind of discuss them here. This will be a lot of fun. I, I, I'm really excited about all sorts of these new champions. So let's go ahead and start here with Renekton. So, all right, Renekton is a four mana, four, four. Um, it is an ascended champion. That's gonna be key. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it, it has overwhelm, a really good quality keyword. When I challenge an enemy, give me plus two, plus one this round. And level up, I've dealt 12 plus damage. So as you can see, we're going to want to pair Rennington with a lot of ways to be able to give Rennington challenge, a challenger, or maybe our enemies vulnerable. That's another way to be able to have Rennington at challenge. Um, and so once Rennington deals 12 plus damage, so kind of similar to um, Shivana level up with how Shivana needs to see dragon. Like Shivana is also a four mana four four. Shivana needs to see dragons deal 12 plus damage. Rennington needs to deal 12 plus damage itself to level up. Once Renekton is leveled up, we have um, a 5-5 five five with Overwhelm. Uh, attack, give me plus 3, plus 3 this round. That is crazy. And that's any attack. It doesn't have to be challenging or anything. Any attack, we're attacking as an 8-8 eight, eight Overwhelm. That is huge. And to level up the second time, you have to restore the Sun Disk. Okay, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, that's not very easy to do. But if you are able to do that it will actually level up a second time. That's right, we have a new thing with these new champions in Shurima, just a couple of them. There's three champions that are ascended champions and those three champions can level up twice. They all have the second um, level up clause of restoring the sun disk. And if you are able to do that with Renekton, then you <laughs> Renekton will be now a 10-10 with Overwhelm. Talk about killing your opponent super fast. You know, uh, that, you know, that uh, it's basically like a they who endure body, right? A 10 10 overwhelm that is huge. And then, whenever I block or attack, then it does two damage to the enemies and the enemy nexus. So that's like um, uh, Anivia's ability, but then also uh, when it blocks, also. So, so you get the Anivia ability when you block or attack, and you have a 10 10 overwhelm. Absolutely crazy body here um, for Renekton. Now, it's not going to be easy to get this second level up restoring the sun disk all right so basically to restore the sun disk what that what that's talking about it's talking about this new landmark that's a one mana landmark here the buried sun disk now if your entire deck is all full of shurima cards if you have 40 shurima cards and no other region whatsoever then at the start of the game you get to just draw the buried sun disk from your deck so you'll start with your four regular cards and then you'll have a fifth card in your hand at the very beginning of the game, which will be the Sun Disc. You'll just uh, be able to draw it from, from your deck. So you only have to play like one, maybe two Sun Discs if you're worried about your opponent destroying your landmark. Um, and it will automatic, like you'll automatically have one start in your hand, which is pretty awesome. But it has countdown to 25 in order to restore the Sun Disc. So we talked about how you have to restore it to level up your second champion. Um, it has countdown to 25. And basically what countdown means is that the round, the round start, you take you know tick one down so all you need is 25 round starts um that's <laughs> that's not easy to do in a game um but it has that second clause when you when an ascended ally levels up advance me 10 rounds um so that that means that like whenever whenever our renekton levels up um the first time whenever it's dealt 12 12 damage then boom knock knock off 10 turns from your buried sun disc <clears throat> okay so talking about Renekton, so let's kind of let's kind of break this card down. Um, as far as as far as like what we start with, we start with a four four overwhelm for four, and that's a good card. That is, um, but it's not 
it's not anything like super special, right? Like we're starting to see more four mana four fours be printed. We talk about how Shivan is a four mana four four, um, but then also we have um, the there's the um, the sea monster that's a four mana four four. There's also a regular dragon um, that's a in Targon that's a four mana four four, and just even like some different Targon cards are four mana four fours. Like there's like the one that like you can you play it and you give like something else overwhelm. Like there's there's a decent amount of four mana four fours running around. So while it's it's a, definitely a good body because four health doesn't die till a lot of like the played removal spells, it's not it's not something like super special, right? It's not like wow, that's that's game changing kind of stats for a four drop. It's kind of where the bar is set, and so Rennington like hits that bar. Um, uh, but there are larger four drops, right? Like there's like the Crimson Awakener is a four mana five five. Um, you have Bull Elnuk, which is a four mana four five, right? Like, you know, you play Rennington, your opponent plays Bull Elnuk. You're like, oh, no, I can't get through. But like, so like the big thing is going to be about like this challenge. Can we give Rennington a challenge? Um, can we challenge with Rennington reliably? So it, it feels like Demacia is a really good region to pair with Rennington. Demacia has um, the Grand Plaza as like a really good three mana Um a really good three mana uh, landmark that you can play Grand Plaza and then you play Rennington. And now uh, Rennington is a 5 4 challenger. And then whenever you challenge, it also gets an additional plus two, plus one. So now it's like a 7 5 challenger. So that's really nice. Plus, Demacia would give you access to cards like Single Combat and Concerted Strike, more ways to be able to strike with Rennington and more ways to be able to have Rennington deal damage because we need, we need Rennington to deal 12 damage to level up. So Demacia seems like a perfect uh, combination there. Now, another thing about Rennington and like just champions in general is talking about their champion spells. Um, Rennington has a really good quality champion spell. Ruthless Predator here, give an ally plus two plus zero and an enemy vulnerable this round. This is a good way to, you know, use this as a removal spell. You can, uh, you know, give for two mana burst speed, you give whatever champion your opponent has vulnerable and you can, you can use your Rennington to challenge it. And then, you know, your, uh, your Rennington gets that plus two, plus one. Or you can even use, like, other things to challenge, right? Like, giving something vulnerable is pretty nice. And it's really nice that it's at burst speed and you can immediately uh, challenge with that. Um, there's also another, um, another spell that looks really nice here in Shurima as far as giving things vulnerable, this exhaust. So focus means that's like the new term for gem speed where it's burst but you can only, you can't play it during combat um so like you play exhaust it's burst and then you do other things like y'all know like how gems work um from targon and so that's that's the new keyword for gem speed um and so like so you'll have your exhaust and then give an enemy minus two minus zero and vulnerable this round that that seems really great with Renekton because you want you want Renekton to challenge and so you'll have vulnerable with that. And with the enemy getting minus two, minus zero, you can keep a good amount of health on your Rennington after it challenges because you, you don't want your Rennington to die because you want it to level up. So I think like these kind of cards and then maybe paired with like a Demacia region could be pretty clutch with a Rennington deck. But it's basically, can you level up this Rennington? Because while the 4-4 Overwhelm is good, can you get Challenger to get that plus two, plus one, which is really nice? And can you level it up? Because once you level up Rennington just one time, the, this attack give plus three, plus three this round is awesome. Even bigger than Shivana's like plus two, plus two. Um, very awesome. If you ever restore the Sun Disk and level up a third time, this is just completely game winning, obviously. But um, that's going to be like the key part to like how much Rennington is played. Is like how, how easy can we get Challenger with Rennington and how much can we get the plus three, plus three. Okay, so last thing about about as, as far as like leveling these things up, and as far as um, getting this buried sun disc, um, like I said, we have we have two other champions that are ascended, and we have this card here, Ascendance Rise. Um, that well, whenever we looked at this the very first time, whenever we uh, whenever Renekton was previewed, we were like, I don't know about this. This is seven mana, and it's slow speed to just level up a level one ascended ally. Our only ascended ally at the time was simply Ren Renekton, and so like, are we going to spend seven mana just to level up a Renekton? That doesn't seem like a very good card. But now that we have two other ascended champions, and we're going to kind of scroll up here. 
we're going to have Gnosis is going to be another Ascended Champion. That's going to be a six mana champion here. That's not the easiest to level up by itself, but with Descendants Rise, it would level it up right away. And then we also have the last champion that was previewed, Azir, another Ascended Champion at three mana here. Um, a little easier to level up, but if it's not leveled up, the Ascendants Rise can. The strength of putting those together is you can play two copies of each champion, and the hope is to have two of the three champions in play at some point in the game that aren't leveled up, right? You have like Azir, Gnosis, and now and Renekton. You can maybe get two of them in play. Um, you know, like like uh, Renekton is a four drop. Azir is a three drop. If you can get them both in play, and then you can cast your Ascendance Rise, that will basically, if you can get use Ascendance Rise to level up two champions, that's the goal. Um, can you can you level up two different champions with Ascendance Rise? Because if you can, then now suddenly your Buried Sun Disks that usually takes Countdown 25, that will advance it 20. And that, now we're talking. Now, like, we advanced that thing 20. Now it only had, like, the Countdown to 5. All you had to do is wait 5 total turns. If you played this on turn 1, you've probably already gone through the 5 turns by the time you're playing the 7-mana card. And so now we're talking about restoring the Sun Disk um, fairly easily after that. And once you... and. Uh, <clears throat> when you do restore the sun disc you can see that it says for the rest of the game your level two ascendants are level three and so for the rest of the game uh, that means that instead of just going from level one to two you're really actually just going to level three and then we're talking about some ridiculous power with all three of your ascended champions so that that that's a real thing so now having three different champions can you get two of them in play at the same time and then cast the ascendants rise level them both up um, and now we're talking. Now we're now we're restoring our Sun Disc, and then we're talking about some ridiculous stuff. And we'll talk about what the other two champions do when they get to level two and three later. Um, this, yeah. So this does this uh, restored Sun Disc has to be in play for this thing to happen for the for the rest of the game. Your level two, um, I think that has to continue to be in play for that to happen. But maybe not. I guess it does say for the rest of the game. So maybe I guess you can replace the restored Sun Disc in play. And then that will still count. Um, but you do also immediately get to draw one of all three champions, which is awesome. So you get to draw whatever, basically whatever champions you have left, draw them right away. Um, so, bear, okay, so Buried Sun, yeah, so this has to sit in play. But once you have it leveled up, you draw all of these and then you can replace it. Okay, because this is the rest of the game. All right, so final grade here with our Renekton. Um, looks like a, a strong body has... Um, some incredible upside that if you can get to level two and then especially level three with your Renekton, it's going to be incredibly powerful. Um, but then also it's a it's a big body that if you can give it Challenger um, or if you give your other things vulnerable, if you use its it has a good champion spell. That's always key for your champion. So a very good champion spell that and it works really well with the champion. And we have a new card like Exhaust that works really well with it. So if you put those together, I think this is going to be a pretty solid champion. Now it's not, it's not, it doesn't just like get a whole bunch of card advantage or take over a game on its own. It does kind of require you to do some other stuff alongside with it. As far as our uh, tier list, we're putting Rennington right there at a solid B for our uh, tier list that we're going to have for our nine new champions. Rennington's going to be right there on the B tier. All right, so there's our first champion. Our second champion that was previewed was Jarvan. And so we have Jarvan 4. Um, Jarvan's going to be a 6-mana Demacia champion. So Demacia's getting a new one. 6-mana, 5-3 with Barrier. Now, Barrier is something that only lasts the turn that you play it. Think about Lux. Lux is a 6-mana Demacia champion with Barrier, and that Barrier goes away after a turn. That's how it's going to work with Jarvan as well. When you attack... Pay my cost to summon me, challenging the strongest enemy. Now, this is a this is a weird sentence that took that took a little while to kind of understand what this means. So this is when you attack, and that that's not when Jarvan attacks. Okay, just when you attack in general, at at all, any any time you attack, this happens. Now it says, pay my cost to summon me, challenging the strongest enemy. What? So in order for that to happen, Jarvan has to be in your hand. Okay, so this isn't. Jarvan can't be in your deck, and then this happens. But basically, if you have Jarvan in your hand, 
and you attack with other other units then what you can do is you can pay the six mana and not like not using spell mana using your regular mana you spend six mana on your and then jarvan just gets summoned from your hand into play and it's immediately challenging the strongest enemy think about like whenever you have a leveled up quinn and your leveled up quinn attacks and it just brings a valor that's automatically challenging the strongest enemy it's like that but so the reason why like so this is a really really powerful ability and the reason why is because one of the strongest things you can do in legends of runeterra is to open attack that means like whenever your opponent passes the turn to you and you just immediately attack before playing anything else because if you play something then your opponent can cast a ruination or you know they have the opportunity to do whatever they want so open attacking is usually a really really powerful effect and what Jarvan does is you get to open attack. You get to take your turn, open attack, and then you know you attack, you spend your six mana, and now Jarvan is in play, has the barrier, and is challenging the strongest enemy, is a five power challenger with barrier. And so it's basically like you can kind of think of Jarvan being burst speed in that effect because your opponent won't get to respond to that happening. Now Jarvan's just suddenly challenging their strongest enemy. So that's why Jarvan is going to be really good is because it, it's basically like a burst speed champion. You just have to be able to attack with something else. And now Jarvan's coming in and challenging the strongest enemy at five power. Very strong effect. As far as the level up clause, Jarvan has um, your, your allies have to survive four plus strikes from enemy blockers. So that means you have to um, basically, you know, using uh, challengers or maybe you're attacking and they're blocking they have to have their blockers strike your um, allies. So if you have like, if you challenge like zero power units, like a monkey idol, or you frostbite something and then challenge it and it's zero power, zero power is not going to strike your enemy blocker. So that doesn't count. So they have to, you have to, um, yeah. So you, so you have to have four plus things attack, they block, and that could be because you challenge, but you have to attack, they have to block, and then your ally has to survive. So that's not like the, the easiest level up clause to happen. Now Jarvan by itself should count as one because like the strike, ha like if you strike a barrier, that does count as a strike. You know, it's striking the barrier and that's your um, ally surviving. So Jarvan will count as one if it challenges and, you know, has the barrier, it survives the strike there. So that'd be one, but you got to get four. If you're able to do that, um, then we have our level up Jarvan. Let's see what we got over here for level up Jarvan. So again, it has the barrier. It's now 6-4, right? It gets the, the plus one, plus one from the level up. It still has that that same clause of how you can, um, you know, like burst speed in a Jarvan. But then it also has round start, create a fleeting cataclysm in hand. And also whenever I challenge an enemy, give me barrier this round. So normally your regular leveled up or your regular Jarvan only has barrier the one turn. But now whenever you level up Jarvan, um, anytime it challenges, so if you have other ways to give Jarvan challenger again, then it will be getting barrier each time it challenges, which is pretty awesome. So the round start also creates a fleeting cataclysm. Let's check out what that card is. And that card is also Jarvan's champion spell. So it, it's, you know, you make, you make your champion spell for Jarvan um, at the, at the uh, round start. And so Jarvan's champion spell is three mana, slow speed, an ally starts a free attack challenging an enemy. Okay, so this is this is kind of crazy. So you get an ally starting a free attack challenging an enemy. Basically, it's kind of like a three mana relentless. You know, relentless pursuits three mana. Also, it's kind of like relentless pursuits, but you only have one ally attack, and you get to challenge whatever enemy you want. Um, so that's that's kind of what that is. It's it's kind of weird, but you just get you just get a basically one challenge. So it's you can kind of think of it also like single combat, I guess, right? Like um, single combat costs two and it has two things fight, but it's kind of like that. It's just you get the challenge, and the reason why, but so like the, the challenge uh, is really beneficial to be able to have that. The reason why you get the attack and challenge, the reason why that's really nice is because when you have your leveled up Jarvan, you get the barrier. And um, this pair is awesome with scouts because with scouts, um, it says that 
like the just the scout ability says that if you attack one time with only with units with scout then you get to ready your attack and you get to attack you get the attack token again so if you use this jarvin's cataclysm on some ally that has scout then that scout ally challenges and so it's like a single combat kind of but since it's a scout a, technically attacking then you get an additional attack and you get to ready your attack um and so then you get to an additional attack with all of your units um so that's pretty awesome this free attack though it can only be just the one thing attacking and it just challenges one thing so that's why it's kind of like single combat but if that one thing is it is a scout then boom you get to attack again and then of course if you do have champions like misfortune or quinn um, that care about you attacking then you all, or if you have any any cards with abilities that whenever you attack do x um, any of those things would trigger with this cataclysm because you get that because um, it is technically an attack instead of like a single combat that's that's not technically an attack the cataclysm also really helps um your jarvan uh level up right because if you can have your your ally survive this be, you know because you need your your ally to survive that and yeah so this is so yeah this cataclysm on your opponent's turn is especially powerful because you get that attack on your opponent's um turn where you don't normally get that attack so Jarvan looks really cool. Look, looks like a really strong champion. I think like this clause here is going to be really strong um, coming in like with burst speed attacking with challenge um, on the strongest enemy. It makes all of your other attackers better because um, Jarvan's coming in on the uh, uh, the strongest one, taking the strongest one out. Speaking of Jarvan and scouts, another thing I didn't really point out. Like let's say you have like some scouts in play, right? And and you know maybe even like a Quinn or something, and uh, and so what you do, so what you're going to do is like, we're talking about open attacking with, with your jar, your Jarvins in your hand, you attack with your, with only scouts. Since you attack with only scouts, you get an, an additional attack step. But then also when you attack, you can still pay your cost to summon Jarvin. So you still spend your six mana with your open attack with your scouts. Jarvin will come in and attack with your scouts, but since technically you only attacked with your scouts, you will get an additional attack step. So that's another way that Jarvin really pairs well with scouts. So you can actually attack with Jarvin twice in a turn, even though Jarvin doesn't have scout. That's kind of a cool little loophole that you get to do there. Um, so that that's pretty cool. And then, um, yeah, so that, that's something that's pretty cool. Uh, but there we go. And there's, there's, um, Jarvan is also, I guess the last thing to talk about is Jarvan is an elite. And so there is going to be some other, uh, good elites here with this new expansion. And so elites are going to, um, get some more. What's up, Buzzy on. Thank you so much for the, uh, sub there. Let's go ahead and, and put this in here. <laughs> anyway, so like I was saying is that uh, elites are getting some more support in this expansion so if you're a fan of elites there are going to be some other good elites and other good challengers and uh, good elite cards like another good elite one drop and stuff we're not going to go through every single card in this video because it you know that'd take a long time but there are going to be some new good um, elites um, another card though to talk about is we have king jarvan the third um, and so king jarvan is going to be kind of this is kind of like jarvan's warship where um, it says it's a seven mana three six when I'm summoned draw Jarvan the fourth so this is your way this is your Leviathan to draw your Swain you know that kind of thing your Siren to draw Misfortune Dreadway draw Gangplank you know like those warships King Jarvan's your warship so you you draw you play King Jarvan you get to draw Jarvan the fourth and then but it also says if Jarvan's already in play so now with this card you actually get a bonus if Jarvan's in play the other cards you don't get any kind of bonus if um, their champion is in play. But if Jarvan's in play, instead, you give all of your allies challenger and scout this round. Pretty awesome. You give both itself and any of your other things, you know, your Jarvan plus whatever else you have in play. You play King Jarvan, which is tough. And then all of your allies have challenger and scout this round. Pretty awesome. Um, so there we go. So the, the pretty good champion here for Demacia. I'm real excited about Jarvan. I think Jarvan's going to be real solid. We're putting Jarvan all the way up in the A tier for the new expansion. I think that this is going to play really well, having a uh, basically a burst speed champion that is also removal that gets to challenge the strongest enemy with barrier. 
pretty excited here about Jarvan and all the new Demacia cards coming. On to our next champion. The third champion that was previewed was Talia. Talia is 5 mana, 2-4 from Shurima. Uh, whenever you play Talia, you get to summon an exact copy of an allied landmark. Okay, so any landmark that you have in play that you like, you play Talia, get an additional copy of that landmark. So that's um, pretty awesome, especially if, if you have some really good landmarks, and we'll talk about some in just a second. So Talia doesn't level up until you've summoned 5 plus landmarks, but once you have summoned 5 plus landmarks and you have a leveled up Talia, now Talia still has the same playability. It gets the plus 1 plus 1 from being leveled up, and it has an attack trigger now. Whenever you attack, deal 2 to my blocker. If it's dead or gone, deal 2 to the enemy nexus instead. If you have a landmark, do this 2 more times. And we can kind of assume you're going to have a landmark, and so you're going to be able to do this uh, 2 more times. You have 3 of these. Now it says deal 2 to my blocker if I'm dead or gone. What that means is that if Talia is not being blocked. So like if they, if they choose not to block Talia, then that 2 damage is going to the nexus. And so you, if you do it 2 more times, you get 6 direct damage to the nexus if they don't block Talia. If they do block Talia, you deal 2 to the blocker. Is it is it dead? If if not, you know, if not, deal two more to the blocker. If yes, then start dealing two to the nexus. Really powerful attack ability. We gotta summon five plus landmarks for that to happen. And we're gonna want to have some cool landmarks to copy. Alright, so this like if you think about like just in uh the game right now, there's not that many landmarks running around, and a lot of them are kind of more expensive, but could be really nice to copy. Um, but there it's it'd be in really impossible to get five plus landmarks for like the what the game looks like right now but thankfully this new expansion does have a lot of talia enablers and there's just a lot of landmarks um going around so kind of looking at some of the landmarks that from the new expansion that could work well with talia you have things like these landmarks there's a good amount of landmarks with countdown and if they hit a certain countdown number they'll summon a big spooky monster um, you know, like a grumpy rock bear or something. So like this hibernating rock bear has the countdown three that, um, you know, then will then turn into a five, four for like, that's an example here. You have salt spire. That's a four mana landmark that has the countdown of only two instead of three. And, uh, whenever you hit that countdown two, you get your grumpy rock bear. Um, uh, but if you've summoned four plus landmarks, this game, then you grant your strongest ally plus two plus two as well. So that grumpy rock bear could be a seven, six instead of just a 5-4. So there's some there's some cool ways to get some some landmarks like that uh, that, you know, like they can get you to the five landmarks. Uh, now, another really good card, like this is just going to be a really good card in the new set. This is Ancient Hourglass. Two mana, fast speed, obliterate an ally and summon a stasis statue in its place. So it's two mana, fast speed, and obliterating an ally. You can that's kind of like Glimpse Beyond. Think about Glimpse Beyond, two mana, fast speed, you sacrifice an ally. You know, you destroy your own ally. It's kind of like that kind of thing. Glimpse Beyond allows you to draw two cards. The Ancient Hourglass says stump, summon a Stasis Statue. A, st a Stasis Statue is a two mana landmark that has countdown one, summon an exact copy of the obliterated unit I replaced. So after one turn with the countdown one, you just get your, whatever you obliterate, you get it back into play, the exact copy. It gets the, the same buffs if, if you had any buffs or anything like that. So that's really nice because um, sometimes they have like challenger that they're going to kill your champion, right? And you don't want your champion to die. You don't want your champion to get, uh, to get challenged and get killed. Or they use like, you know, whatever removal spell, like a vengeance on your champion. Well, you get to Ancient Hourglass, your champion, and um, basically, you know, remove it from play and put put this landmark into play instead. And uh, then in one turn, you'll remove that landmark and your champion will come back into play and things will be better. You're like, all right, I saved it, right? So you get to use this to save stuff. And so like, this is going to be a really nice, powerful card. This also works great with Talia because think if you if you have like the Stasis statue in play, and then you play your Talia and you summon an exact copy of the, the landmark. So like you just saved a champion and now you have Talia get you another one of those stasis snares or whatever, the, the stasis card landmarks. And now in one turn, they'll both go away and you get two more copies of those champions, whatever, whatever you saved or, you know, like whatever card you, you uh, stasis statue, whatever card you saved. 
that could be a really cool use for Talia's um, ability. As far as like the the cards that we currently have, um, Talia could work well with like Freljord. Like like maybe the most powerful landmark that's in the game right now is um, the Howling Abyss, the seven mana landmark. If you have a Howling Abyss in play and you play Atalia, you can get an additional copy of the Howling Abyss. You have two Howling Abysses making two uh, level two champions every single turn. Uh, that that would be pretty insane. That's something you could do. Another reason why you'd want to pair uh, Talia with Freljord, though, is there's also a lot of new Freljord landmarks in this expansion. So something. Let's, so let's take a look at some of these. Uh, you have Blighted Ravine. When you're summoned, heal your Nexus Four, right? So just heal your Nexus Four. That's going to keep you alive for longer. That's good. Countdown deal one. Countdown one deal two to everything. Maybe not the best countdown one whenever you're playing Talia. And if you copy this. While you would heal your Nexus 4 again, um, then this would do 2 to everything. Your your new one that you just made would deal 2 to everything. Those kind of kill your Talia. It's maybe not necessarily the best, but <laughs> that's an option. Yeah, Frozen Thralls. These these are another way to get like really large um, units in play. You get 8-8 eight, eight Overwhelm in play after Countdown 8. It has a long count, large countdown, but again, you know, another way to get some uh, cheap landmarks in play. The Frozen Tomb, we'll talk about that later, but that's actually for your opponent um, getting that one. But, you know, like, so there's, so Freljord can get you some some other cool landmarks besides just Howling Abyss. Um, Targon is another region that could maybe pair well with Talia, because right now, if you think about what's the most played um, landmark in the game, it's the the Veil Temple, right? And that's, Veil Temple getting an, an additional copy of would be awesome, because you could have two Veil Temples in play. Now, once you play two spells, you get four additional mana. You give something like your Talia or whatever else, whatever your largest thing in play, you give it plus two, plus two. So Targon with Talia could be a really nice pairing. As far as Targon goes, there is a new Targon landmark that would be really great to copy, the Star-Tipped Peak. This is a two-mana landmark with Countdown 2 that creates two random celestial cards that cost three or less in hand. So you know... Um, Zoe's ability to, uh, you know, to get that super cool star chart. Super cool star chart makes a three uh, cost or less celestial card. Now you get to invoke that, so you get to kind of choose what you want. This is random, but you get two of them, so that's that's awesome. Like the celestial cards are great. So imagine you have you have this in play. You go Talia, copy it again. Now countdown, they'll go away. So right, you don't have to worry about like your board filling up with just like all these landmarks because like the countdown thing, they they do go away. They get they get destroyed whenever the countdown happens. But now you can suddenly have like four celestial cards that cost three or less, and those can be really powerful. And that'll get you on your way also of getting whoops, where are you at, Talia? Of getting your five plus landmarks to level up your Talia. So this is a, this is a difficult uh, champion to. Well, let's let's talk about one last thing actually. Let's talk about the uh, the champion spell. Champion spells are always important with your champions. Uh, Talia's champion spell is Stone Weaving. One mana burst. Um, look at three random landmarks you can afford. Pick one to create in hand. So this is pretty awesome. All right. So um, you don't really want to play this landmark on turn one, or you, you don't really want to play this on turn one. Because you'd only have one mana gem, and so you'd look at three random one-cost landmarks, which there are there are some one-cost landmarks in this expansion, um, and I guess there was even some more landmarks down here, right? Like this is another like countdown landmark that costs one mana, and then you make a two-two after uh, two turns with the countdown two, um, and uh, something like this, like this is a two-mana landmark, summon it, draw a card. After two more countdowns, you draw another one. This would be another good good one to just make a copy of. Have your Talia draw draw a card, and and then in two turns you draw an additional card. So there's some other cool like little landmarks here that that I didn't mention yet. But um, this whole this stone weaving, look at three random landmarks you can afford. Those those are just random landmarks that are in the game. So you could be playing targon and sharima as your two regions and like let's say it's turn seven you have seven mana gems you cast stone weaving since you have seven mana gems you could you could afford any landmark that costs seven or less you'll get three random ones so maybe one of them is the howling abyss so this could be you could play the targon sharima play stone weaving and you just uh create a 
uh, Howling Abyss in hand that you could play. Pretty awesome. So yeah, so this is, it's basically like Invoke. If you think about like Invoke, how you, you invoke three Celestial cards. Um, but this is three landmarks. But they are only landmarks that are, that cost, uh, their cost is equal to or less than the number of mana gems that you have. So you want to wait a while. If, if you want expensive landmarks, you want to wait a while before playing this. Um, so there we go. Uh, so this, so that's a pretty cool um, champion spell. That's definitely a very useful champion spell. So anyway, overall, Talia is this is a really difficult card to kind of grade on the on our uh, tier scale um, because it's only like Talia doesn't have any keywords. That's that's a negative. A two four for five mana is a pretty bad body. That's definitely a negative too. So Talia is not going to be very good in combat. Doesn't have any keywords. You really, really need to build around Talia with the landmarks. But with that being said, Talia may be pretty, you know, may be pretty powerful depending on what you get to copy with your landmarks, depending on how good that effect is. And then if you are able to level up Talia, this attack ability is awesome. Um, so it's it's really difficult to to evaluate Talia. We're actually placing Talia um, to start with here on the C tier, honestly, because of the. Um, because of the 2-4 body for 5, which is really bad, not having any keywords, and it you need to have a landmark in play. If you don't have a landmark in play, your Talia is going to look real silly. Um, and then even like the like you have a landmark, maybe even two landmarks in play, you play Talia, you copy another landmark, you're seeing how like that can start taking up your entire board of only having landmarks and this 2-4 champion that you don't want to attack or block with. It can make combat really, really difficult for you. Um, also, so we'll have to see how this plays, but just starting with, we're going to start with Talia actually at, uh, tier C, uh, because of all of those, uh, potential downsides in the card, but a really interesting champion and, uh, you know, different champion. And it'll be real interesting to see how it plays and to try it out. All right. And the next champion revealed was Lissandra three mana for a Frel your champion with tough. And I think that tough is going to be a really, really good keyword on this card and just a really good keyword in general. I think that's a, an underrated keyword. We've seen how difficult it is to kill Vi that has Vi has four health in tough and is a five mana champion. Lissandra is a three mana champion that has three health and tough only one less health for two less mana. So I, th I think Lissandra is going to play very well. It's a 2-3. That tough's going to be awesome. Now it says whenever I'm summoned, summon a frozen thrall. So you play Lissandra, you immediately get a frozen thrall as well. So you immediately get this extra landmark. So if you want to play like a Thalia, uh, sorry, a Talia deck that has the, uh, you know, the, the cares out the landmarks, that's cool. But so you get your frozen thrall immediately and it has the countdown eight. Um, again, that whenever you... Uh, reach the countdown, you get an 8-8 Overwhelm that uh, is technically an 8-mana card. And that's important because Lissandra levels up whenever it says when you summon 2-plus allies that cost 8-plus mana, you get to um, level up Lissandra. So those are summon, not cast, and so whenever your Frozen Thrall goes away, it does summon an 8-cost ally. So you have to just have two of those to level up your Lissandra. Now, when your Lissandra levels up, you create a Watcher in hand. So it, when you level up Lissandra, not only do you get the leveled up Lissandra, but you also create this Watcher in hand. So this Watcher is a 17 mana unit. There we go. 17 mana unit. It's an 11, 17. Now, you can't, you can't spend 17 mana on a unit. You can only get 10 mana. So how are we doing this? Well, it says I cost zero if you've summoned four plus allies that cost eight plus mana this game. So if you've gotten four of those allies summoned, then now the Watcher costs zero and it has attack obliterate the enemy deck. Now, if you don't have any cards in your deck and you try drawing, you lose the game. So this is basically attack, your opponent loses the game. Um, it's not technically that, but it's basically that. Uh, it's going to be really, really, really difficult to survive. You know, the, basically, the only way to survive if that happens is you have like a champion in play and that same champion in your hand, and so you can cast a champion spell and put the champion spell, put the champion back into your deck. That's about it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's pretty awesome. 
But now that's not all. That's not all. Like Lissandra also levels up. So let's take a look. So leveled up Lissandra says your nexus is tough. That is incredible. Every single source of damage to your nexus gets reduced by one because it will have tough. That is incredible for your leveled up Lissandra. Um, it still has the summon, like whenever you summon a Lissandra, you get your frozen thrall as well. Um, but then this is an it. Also, round start. We're going to cr start creating even more cards. It creates a, a fleeting zero cost ice shard every single round start. Ice shard is usually a three mana fast spell that deals one to everything. So kind of like avalanche at four mana slow that does two to all the units. This does one to everything, so that includes the two Nexuses. But of course, your Nexus should be tough because you have a leveled up Lissandra in play, so it will do one damage to like your opponent's Nexus and then also one damage to everything. But um, that's awesome. So this Lissandra is looking really cool. But in order to really take advantage of Lissandra's abilities, of course, we're going to have to level up Lissandra, so we need to summon these, these uh, two allies that cost eight plus mana. So how easy is it going to be to do that? That's like the real question here with Lissandra. How can, how can we uh, summon these? So we talk about the Frozen Thrall. Now Frozen Thrall has that countdown eight. That means you have to wait till eight round starts. That's a really, really long time for these Frozen Thralls. So we're going to pair Lissandra with this uh, new epic. This is going to be a, a huge part of Lissandra decks. This is, this is what's going to make Lissandra even better. Because this is another way to put a Frozen Thrall into play this um, Draclorn Inquisitor, but it has this um, round end ability. This is what's really important. If the countdown of any of your Frozen Thralls is four or less, advance them to zero. So you really only need to wait four turns with your Frozen Thrall um, and then and get the countdown to four. And then if you have this Draclorn Inquisitor in play, boom, there you go. Advance them to zero if it's four or less. Um, so Frozen Thrall is just a regular common that you can just play on its own. So you can just you can just play Frozen Thrall on turn one. You can have your Lissandra put Frozen Thrall into play. Your Dark Lord Inquisitor put Frozen Thrall into play. Um, so it's a nice little package of getting Frozen Thralls. And then once they get to four, instead of having to uh, go all the way down from eight to zero, they just have to go from eight to four. And then boom, now you get your eight eight, your eight eight overwhelms, and now that's your eight uh, cost unit for your Lissandra. Now, that's not the only thing to do with Lissandra. There's other ways to, to get eight cost things into play. You can also just play Lissandra with ramp. We are in Freljord. Freljord's the region with um, good ramp cards, you know, your Catalyst of Aeons, that kind of stuff. And you can just cast, um, you know, like your, your eight plus cost allies, right? Like uh, a lot of Freljord cards already cared about eight plus cost allies. Um, and so you can just summon those as well. Maybe you play Lissandra with Trundle. Trundle makes that ice pillar, you know, you... Uh, that ice pillar costs eight mana and then it also refills your mana so you you follow up ice pillar with you know whatever a, an infinite mind splitter or um the the new newish eight uh eight cost freljord card that either destroys all landmarks or does two damage to all the allies you know how you get to choose which one i forgot the name of that card but if you just play like the ice pillar and then another like eight cost ally like that that's two of them immediately so that would level up Lissandra right away so Lissandra seems to pair really well with Trundle and Ice Pillar also um, and then there's and then besides that and so then that that that's one way to get your leveled up Lissandra besides that there's like other ways to kind of cheat out Watcher um, there's the most obvious one's probably Targon's Peak how you, you can play Targon's Peak with um, with this kind of deck now Targon's Peak makes things cost zero so they wouldn't have, they wouldn't help you level up your Lissandra. But basically, how that would help is that if you are able to level up your Lissandra, okay. So if you are able to level up your Lissandra and you create a Watcher in hand, then that's that's a way that like Targon's Peak can make your um, Watcher cost zero mana, and so you'd be able to just you know play it for zero and then attack and win the game. Um, another card is with Freljord. There's um, Revitalizing Roar. Seven mana. Um, that whenever you're in, that you uh, heal your nexus equal to the power of some ally in your hand, and whenever you're enlightened, you reduce that card to be zero cost. So if you're ramping and you play like your ice pillar, and then you play your other eight drop, 
and you level up your Lissandra, then um, you know when you get to 10 mana, because you're ramping, you play that Revitalizing Roar, make your Watcher cost zero, and get that thing into play. That could be another really cool way to um, get Watcher into play. But this is this is just like the perfect region for Lissandra. Freljord has a lot of ramp, and it has a lot of um, defensive abilities, a lot of Nexus healing and things like that. So you can really slow the game down and get to a longer game and win with the Watcher. Another real, like a, just a really cool Freljord card to kind of point out here is this Entomb. This Entomb's a five mana fast spell, obliterate an an enemy unit. Or just, I guess, any unit. You just obliterate any unit and then summon a fro frozen tomb in its place. And so you can you can get rid of your opponent's cards. You can get rid of your card. Either way, you um, frozen tomb, it has the countdown to, to summon an exact copy of the obliterated unit. Um, they, they showed this in the video of where you can obliterate your opponent's champion. And then you, um, you frozen tomb it. So then it, it's going to come back in two turns. But if you have like that eight mana card that I still can't remember the name of it. That if you play it and you can destroy all landmarks, that's a way to just destroy this landmark and then your opponent's card is gone for good. Yeah, so that's that's going to be Lissandra. So I think Lissandra looks really, really good. I think it's just a, a really good champion. So to kind of um, TLDR Lissandra, so you get you get a 3-mana 2-3 tough champion. You also get a landmark as well, so you get an additional resource with a landmark. And then whenever you level up Lissandra, which is difficult but not impossible at all. But when you do level up Lissandra, you get an additional resource in the Watcher is a card that will definitely win the game if you're able to attack with it. So you get like that game winning resource. You also get your Nexus to be tough. And then you also create an another resource um, every single round start. You get a, a fleeting zero cost Ice Shard, which you can cast. You can discard and draw another card. You know, you can do whatever you want with this Ice Shard um, each turn. So you get... so. It, it can get a lot of resources. It's difficult to kill at the top. It has a very low cost at only three mana, and it has the potential to just w have a game-winning effect. All that together, I think Lissandra is a really strong champion. It's also in the region that allows you... That's probably the best region for protecting your champions in Freljord. It has a lot of cards like Elixir of Iron and Troll Chant and all sorts of cards that um, make it even more difficult for your opponents to kill your champion. So with all that put together, we're throwing Lissandra all the way up in the S tier. And the next champion previewed was Gnosis here from Sharima. Six mana, two, two, fearsome. I have plus one, plus one for each unit that you have slain this game. So slain is a new keyword. Slain is, means um, that basically that's whenever a unit dies, and that means your opponent or yours anything whenever anything dies you have to think who was responsible or what card was responsible for that dying you know did was it like a 1-1 one, one that like your opponent attacked with a 4-3 and you blocked with a 1-1 one, one, right then it was the 4-3 that killed the 1-1 one, one. so that whoever controls the 4-3 which in this this uh, uh scenario would be your opponent they slayed the 1-1 one, one, right so like whenever any unit dies what card killed it and who controlled that card and so um, basically you have to control the cards that kill the unit so if you play a ravenous butcher on your own unit you control the thing that that killed your unit so you just slayed your own unit so that counts as a plus one plus one for gnosis when you attack with a three three and your opponent blocks with a three three both units die your three three killed their three three so you slayed one unit so that'd be one um one plus one plus one for the Gnosis, right? So anytime either your cards kill your opponent's cards in combat, your units, or if you have, um, if you play like a thermogenic beam that kills your opponent's unit, that's you slaying a unit. So that counts as a plus one plus one for Gnosis. Or you play a um, Blighted Caretaker that then sacrifice, you know, that kills your own unit. That counts as a plus one plus one for Gnosis. And then your two one challengers attack. If your if your two one challengers kill other things, then that would add up more for Gnosis. right? So this is going to be um, so a lot of people are just comparing Gnosis to They Who Endure, right? Because They Who Endures gets plus one plus one for each one of your units that have killed that has died this game. Gnosis is slain, so it's it's a different 
um, ability, and we'll have to kind of see how easy it is to slay things and how large Gnosis gets um, overall. Because this is this is like a, a keyword that we just haven't paid attention to, right? Whenever we play games, it feels like you probably do. You probably are responsible for killing a lot of units in a game, <laughs> but you are also responsible, or like you're also could have a lot of things die for a they who endure as well. Um, like with when you're talking about like with they who endure, you'd usually play a card like Hapless Aristocrat that's like a one one, or like Vilefeast that make a one one, and your opponent would attack in, and you would just have your one ones block, and you just have them die, and because you just want to have your things die for they who endure. But if your opponent attacks with something larger, and you have your one one, and you have your one one die. That doesn't count for Gnosis because your opponent killed your one one, so you don't you don't get credit for a slain there. So we'll have to see how much like what the difference really is there and how easy it is to slay things as far as Gnosis goes. We don't know exactly what that's gonna be like yet. But for the most part, that shouldn't be that's probably not gonna be too difficult to get um, a lot of uh, slays in a game, whether you're killing your own units or you're killing your opponent's units. And yeah, so if you if you cast a ruination, how you know that would be your spell killing a bunch of things. So that would be you getting credit for a lot of slain. But overall, so overall, Gnosis uh, should be a very large, fearsome uh, unit as a six six. And now it it uh, levels up once you once it strikes for ten plus damage. So it's kind of like Vi, right? Like Vi needs to strike for ten plus damage to level up. So just like Vi. Um, like, you have to strike for 10, and then you also have to survive that attack. And then Vi would level up, and that's going to be the same with Gnosis. Gnosis has to strike for 10, and then survive the attack, and then it will level up. Um, which Gnosis should be surviving, <laughs> like, that strike anyway, because it gets the plus 1 to the health also, where Vi only gets the plus 1 to the power. Um, when, when Gnosis is leveled up, it gets plus 1, plus 1. It still has that same ability. It still has Fearsome. But then Gnosis does gain a spell shield whenever it levels up. So now it's going to be really large and fearsome. And it will also now suddenly have spell shield. Um, and then also all of your enemies have minus one, minus zero permanently as long as Gnosis is in play. So another real, another powerful thing. Um, so definitely leveled up Gnosis is going to be pretty good getting that spell shield and everything. Um, but we're just kind of, and then, you know, this is an ascended ally. We talked about those earlier with Renekton. Um, this is an ascended ally that will level up when you restore the sun disc. We talked about all that with Renekton earlier, so we don't have to go back into that. Uh, but when you do restore the sun disc and get to level three, then Gnosis is going to be a 10, 10 just as a baseline. So it gets plus seven, plus seven from the level two. But then it still has the plus one plus one, you know, so it could be, you know, 19, 20, 20, you know, like this thing can be huge, could be 30, 40, really, <laughs> you know, it still gets that whole plus one plus one. And it still has fearsome, it still has spell shield, but then all of your enemies have minus three minus zero, which of course, that's really important with the fearsome, it makes it incredibly difficult to block Gnosis. Um... So obviously, Gnosis level three is going to be incredible, just like Renekton level three was incredible. Um, yeah, the, the level three on these is incredible. But the thing is, is, like, how good is this level one? This level one Gnosis honestly looks pretty weak of just being, you know, what, like an 8-8 eight, eight fearsome? You know, I'm just kind of throwing a number out there. You know, just a large fearsome. Think about, like, think about this with, like, Legion General in Noxus. Legion General is a 5-mana 4-4 four, four fearsome that gets plus 1, plus 1 whenever you stun or recall things. And so a lot of times that thing can be a 9-9, nine, nine, a 10-10 ten, ten fearsome for 5-mana. And nobody plays the card because it's just a big fearsome thing. Now, it's like, I, I kind of feel like Noxus is kind of like that, honestly. Now, it, when it does level, if, if you can strike for 10, you can level it up, and now it, it has Spell Shield also, but I mean, you, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not super impressed with this Gnosis. We'll have to see how easy it is to, to get like this whole Slay thing. Maybe you can get Gnosis like Overwhelm. Like if Gnosis had Overwhelm or Elusive or you know some other kind of keyword that helps it really get through and do a lot of damage, um, but as is, I, I, I think this is... For, for my take right now, this is the least impressive of the champions today. Um, and so we're going to be putting Gnosis here in the C tier along with uh, Talia. 
you know, but, but like I said, this is this is something that we're going to have to really try out and we're going to see how easy it is to slay. And then we're, we're still talking about six mana. Like six mana is a lot of mana. Think about like like Hecar- like how Hecarim doesn't really see that much play. And Hecarim's a, a five five with over, you know, Hecarim has overwhelm and also puts other attackers into play also. Um, really good at attacking. Ornosis, like, you know, you just block with a three three and kind of go about your day. Right, Gnosis is a card that's going to be really, really weak to Hush, right? Which Hush is a, a very, uh, a very highly played card. Where if you Hush Gnosis, now you're just talking about a two-two, right? Like and then that can be real trouble. And it's a six mana champion that's so expensive. So um, unfortunately, Gnosis is going to be there in the C tier. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, these are all champions. They're all good cards, right? But, like, we're just kind of putting them in tiers between the different champions. But at the end of the day, like, like Gnosis is not a bad card. And it has it has a ton of potential. And we talked about, like, with level 3, Gnosis is going to be winning the game, right? Like, it's it's incredible. And, you know, you get the spell shield is awesome with level 2 even. So, like, this isn't a bad card. We're just we're trying to rank the champions. And I think this is weaker than other champions, especially for the mana cost. Uh, w- one last thing, though, with Gnosis, we, uh, I forgot to mention the champion spell, right? Like, we always talk about the champion spells with the champion, and that's that's something that I just kind of forgot about here. Um, so this is five mana slow, and ally strikes a unit. Okay, think about Concerted Strike. Concerted Strike's five mana fast, two allies strike a unit. So it's, it's like that. It's the same kind of card, but it is going to be slow speed instead of fast, and it's only one ally instead of two. So those are two downsides. However... If whatever you strikes, whatever you you striked with this this siphoning strike, if it dies, then you get to grant all of your allied champions everywhere plus two plus two, which is absolutely incredible. And so this is going to be a really valuable spell. This, so this is a great champion spell and just a great spell just kind of in general because it's going to be a removal spell. The, it's it's a tricky removal spell because it is slow speed and it's only one ally striking one unit. So there's a lot of things that can kind of go wrong. But if you can if you can pull it off and you can kill their unit with your ally, then granting your ally champions everywhere plus two plus two is incredible. So that, that is a very big plus to the Gnosis, um, this champion spell. So that that plus probably gonna move it to C tier instead of C tier, uh, but that's that's a really good champion spell. All right, there's one other champion previewed that um, also has to do with slaying units, and that's this Kindred. Okay, so Kindred, five mana, four four, quick attack. The first time that you slay a unit each round, I mark the weakest enemy, and then at round end kill units with my mark wow okay so let's talk about this so the first time so kindred has to be in play and then when kindred's in play the first time you slay a unit during a round you mark the whatever the whoever the weakest enemy is you get to mark that all right and again slay means you could kill your own things right you can glimpse beyond your own your own ally that's you slaying a unit you know you can kill one of their units during combat that's slaying a unit you know you attack with kindred they block with something smaller and has quick attack. It kills it. Boom. You slayed a unit. You know, so lots, lots and lots of ways to slay a unit. But whenever you do with, with Kindred in play, then whoever their weakest enemy is, you just mark it. All right. Now, if Kindred survives until the end of turn, and if that enemy survives until the end of the turn, then boom, just, just kill that enemy uh, with this round end ability. So if, if, if it's like your opponent's attack turn, and if you slay like your own unit, like their their weakest enemy will be marked, and they're just gonna send that weakest enemy at you attacking, right? <laughs> they also may have like their own kind of like glimpse beyond to sacrifice their own enemy or you know anything like that. Um, but if but still, it puts a lot of pressure on them because this can just be free removal for weakest enemies, which is awesome. Now if they if they're going wide and they have a bunch of like weak enemies, maybe that's not so great. But if they only have a couple of things in play, like let's say they only have uh, two things in play and you use like, you know, Kindred's here in Shadow Isles, you use a Vengeance on one of their two things. Now they're they're only left with one other um, enemy in play. And now that enemy is go- is just uh, marked right, right away. And it could be something that's awesome, right? It could be, you know, like some large Celestial or whatever. And then round end... 
if Kindred's still in play, boom, you just get to kill that that really good enemy because it was the thing that was marked because it was the only one there. So Kindred has a ton of potential, but either way, it should just be some free removal each turn, which is awesome. Also a 4-4 quick attack for five, not bad at all. Good, A good body, um, good ability, good keyword. Um, so Kindred's looking pretty strong there. Now, um, for the ra for the level up, you have to slay two units with my mark, and that's so. That's again not necessarily the easiest because you have to have your kindred and the enemy both survive until the end of the turn um, in order for it to be marked. So I th I think that that's going to be a little bit more difficult than what it, it reads to level up, but should still be happening sometimes. And so like we have our leveled up kindred now. And now, uh, the first time you slay a unit each round, you get to grant Kindred a plus two, plus two. So that's for the rest of the game, that Kindred will have that plus two, plus two. And then it still does the rest of the stuff. You still mark it and then kill it at the end of turn. So basically, when you have level of Kindred, it, it can grow even larger. And that that's important because once you know you do that one time kindred's now a seven seven now you're attacking with a seven seven quick attack they kind of have to throw like a little one one in front of it all right well they had something die you slayed a unit mark something else so that can just kind of add up so this looks like a really really strong champion anytime you can get free removal that's good um and it's, and uh yes yeah, so i'm really liking kindred here i think this is going to be quite a strong champion um i guess talking about the champion spell champion spell is this uh Kindred's Spirit Journey, five mana, fast, kill a unit, and then revive it. So that that's kind of weird, right? So you kill any unit. It could be theirs. It can be yours. Kill any unit, and then you just revive it. Really where that can, that's probably going to help out the most is with your, to protect your own units, right? So like they challenge your Kindred. You can play this spirit journey, kill your kindred, then revive it. Or you know they, they challenge whatever else. They use a vengeance on one of your things. You can just kill it and then revive it, and then it's out of the way, and so the vengeance gets fizzled, like that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's a protection spell that you can use. But you can also, but it's it's more versatile than just a protection spell because you can also use it on your opponent's units. So the reason why that would be important, like let's say you're playing against you know like a Freljord Overwhelm deck. And they're attacking with a big overwhelm threat, and you're like, man, I can't really survive. Well, you can just kill it, and then sure, you revive it back over there, but you can kind of save that one attack. Maybe they um, they play a battle fury right on whatever. You can kill it, and then uh, and then revive it. And while you didn't get rid of it permanently, you know, it's not like a vengeance that you got rid of it permanently. You at least, you know, it's at least more. It has that versatility, right? Like it can it can kind of do a little bit of everything. You can get rid of your own things to for protection, or you can get rid of their things to get rid of a buff. Maybe they used you know an, an Avaro, Avaros and Outriders to give something plus three plus three and overwhelm, right? Or they've just used like some different buff stuff, or they have they've had like a Veil Temple in play that's given like a bunch of buffs to something. Well, you can just kill it, revive it, get rid of like those kind of those kind of uh, buffs that would have been permanent, and just reset. Um, and of course, obviously, whenever you do that on their unit or do it on your unit, um, then it does count as a slay for kindred for, you know, for slaying something for kindred. So that's important too. So it's, so it's a pretty decent champion spell, right? Like it's probably not like spirit journey is probably not a spell you're like putting into your decks. It's not like a pale cascade that you just like throw three of in your deck, but it's a, it's good for a champion spell that it has like a lot of versatility that whenever you you know, play different games at different points, you, you may want to have access to it. So that's that's a good card there too. All right, so Kindred looks like a really strong champion. Love free removal. Um, looks like a really, really strong champion. Kindred's going up to S tier with Lissandra. Definitely liking how uh, Kindred looks. All right. Up next for our champions is Sivir. Another Shurima champion, 4 mana, 5-3, quick attack, and spell shield. Um, okay, I, I was about to say that I that I think this is the first champion with spell shield, but I guess there's Aurelian Soul. Aurelian Soul is a champion with spell shield. Um, so second champion that I can think of with spell shield. But um, I'm really like, just as this, if you just think about just that as a card, a 4 mana, 5-3, really big body you know five attack for four mana is awesome not very many cards that have that there are a few but not very many it has quick attack 
which makes it really, really difficult to block five power and quick attack, but then also has spell shield. So you don't get to just use, you know, whatever removal spell. You don't get to just grasp the undying sivir right away or, you know, get excited or anything like that. You know, brittle steel. You know, you don't get to do those things right away. You get to protect against the first one with that spell shield. I think that's a really strong combination. So having five power quick attack um, also has some pseudo protection. Um, that's really, really good, honestly. I think that that's just going to be an efficient attacker and going to be difficult to deal with. Um, it It's not necessarily something you want to block with, but it, you can trade up with blocking since it has the five power. If your opponent has, you know, like a Hecarim and they're attacking with that, you can, you know, you can trade your Sivir with the Hecarim, for example, if you do choose to block with it. But, you know, that's that's usually your choice. Um, but yeah, love the love the spell shield and quick attack. Um, spell shield's always a a really good keyword. Like that's that's really nice. So um, it's going to be difficult to level up. Now to level up, you have to deal thirty five plus damage. Now that that sounds like a ton, but that may be actually easier to level up than what you think. Now that doesn't have to be with silver in play, and that that doesn't have to be nexus damage. So whenever your three three attacks and they block with their three three. That's you dealing three damage, so that counts towards your thirty-five, right? Any you block with a one-one, um, and they you know when they attacked with their four-four, you block with a one-one. That's you dealing one damage, right? So like all the combat damage, which like combat damage, there ends up being a lot of combat damage on each side. That will all add up to be the thirty-five plus damage. Of course, whenever Sivir attacks, that's five towards that, um, and so that's like for the entire game, right? So whenever you've done thirty-five damage total for the entire game then at your uh yeah you know, like like think about casting a noxion fervor noxion fervor counts as six you know deals three and then deals three so like that that counts as six towards a, a silver level level up right so like that that 35 like that it looks like a whole lot but that will level up faster than what you think um you know you have something large yeah like a vi that challenges and like a vi challenge you know strikes for eight when it challenges or something like that you know like that that's gonna that's gonna go away faster than you think um, and so then whenever you do level up Sivir, um, it gets the plus one plus one, still has the quick attack and a spell shield. And then while I'm attacking, all of your attacking allies have my keywords. So there are some different cards in this expansion that you can that uh, you can use to be able to give uh, keywords to different champions. Um like this this lucky find and, and things like that and there's there's different cards just in the game that you can uh, help give keywords to you know like maybe you cast like a might on a sil on sivir might plus three plus zero overwhelm well now sivir has quick attack overwhelm and spell shield so whenever you attack all of your other allies would have quick attack overwhelm and spell shield and that's only while they're attacking while sivir is attacking once sivir stops attacking then those allies don't have those keywords anymore so if you um yeah yeah so like if sivir gets removed from combat during the attack phase like let's say let's say the spell shield was already broken up so sivir doesn't have spell shield anymore just has like the quick attack and like overwhelm right so we use might and so we attack with sivir and they use a vengeance and kill the sivir during combat well now all of our our other allies that we thought were going to have quick attack and overwhelm, now they don't have those anymore because Sivir is, you know, removed from uh, combat. So only while they're attacking. So even like the spell shield, the spell shield will go away. Like let's say, you know, you attack with leveled up Sivir, attack with other things. All right, combat's over. You haven't killed your opponent yet. All those other things do not have spell shield anymore. They only had spell shield while Sivir was attacking. That's, an, you know, just another example there. Um, overall, though, I think this is a, a really strong champion just stats-wise, right? Like, this is going to be one of those champions that just has really good stats, is a really good attacker, um, you know, 4-mana, 5-3, quick attack, spell shield. Like, there's not not too much more that you need to have besides that. It does have that nice um, leveled-up ability here that could be really cool, but you really don't need that much else to make a good card besides just um, the quick attack spell shield. This is just going to be an efficient attacker. Um, uh, next up is the champion spell though let's take a look at the champion spell so the champion spell is ricochet which is a six mana and slow speed 
Um, it does have reputation, I cost three. Now reputation is a new keyword. This is gonna be one that's really difficult to pull off. So what rep reputation means is you need to have units strike, units with five plus power strike four times total, okay? So I know that those, those are very, really, it's, I don't like this keyword. Like those are just kind of arbitrary numbers it seems to throw out, right? Like why, like why are those the numbers? I don't know, I guess those are the numbers. So you need to have units that have five plus power strike four plus times. And then if you, if you do that, then you have reputation turned on. There are a lot of new cards in this expansion that are units with five plus power, even some cheaper ones. And so you can see that they're you know kind of building around this keyword a little bit. You have things, um, and, and we're gonna talk about that with our next champion as well, has to deal with that. Obviously Sivir here has five uh, plus power itself. We have, um, you know, Noxus already has kind of cared about the five plus power with cards like Reckoning and Trifarian Assessor. Um, but if you are able to strike four plus times with those kind of allies, then uh, you'll have rep reputation enabled. So it's basically it's something to not really count on. <laughs> um, but if if you have reputation enabled, then it would cost three. So it'd be a, a three mana slow spell instead of a six mana slow spell. All right, it says deal one to a random enemy or the enemy nexus five times. So that's pretty nice. Um, you know, it's, so it's not just deal five, it's deal one five times. Um, that can definitely matter with different things. If they have tough, well, then they're not taking any damage because they, you know, just deal one five times. If you have anything that like buffs up the damage, I don't know, maybe you have a dreadway in play that doubles the damage, maybe a powder keg in play that adds an additional damage right like with a powder keg and then this ricochet it's dealing uh two damage five times right instead of instead of one damage five times to the enemy nexus pretty sure that would work so i think that would just do 10 damage to the enemy nexus with a powder keg pretty sure that's how that would work um yeah because i don't think it would only deal two and then start dealing one i think that powder keg would do that so yeah maybe you have three powder kegs in play and then play ricochet and then that's 20 damage that's four damage five times. I think that's how that works. I think that's a way to do 20 damage. It's three powder kegs and a ricochet. That seems kind of crazy though, doesn't it? But yeah, maybe that's 20 damage. Um, but anyway, uh, so that's that's an okay champion spell. It's you know it can definitely be used as removal. Um, and uh, and so you know, they, that's not a bad champion spell. Like, if your champion spell is removal, that's pretty good. And we're talking about a champion with spell shield. Also really good. It's quick attack. It's really hard to deal with. Um, I'm thinking Sivir looks strong. We're, we're moving Sivir up here into the A tier to go along with Jarvan. I think that's going to be a real strong attacker. Nothing too, like, flashy here. Um, but, you know, sometimes you just need to keep it simple and just keep attacking. So, there we go. Um, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be Sivir over there in the A tier. Then the next champion that was previewed was LeBlanc. And this one's going to be kind of similar to Sivir, how it has the five, uh, power. It does care about a lot of damage being dealt. There's some different Nexus, Noxus cards, sorry, in this expansion that does, um, you know, has, has that reputation keyword, cares about those five plus power allies. Let's take a look. So LeBlanc is three mana, five, two, quick attack. Again, also quick attack, also five power, but costs one less mana, only three mana, but we have one less health. We don't get the spell shield. Um, don't get either of those, but it's still um, three mana, five, two, quick attack. That's a strong attacker. Now to level up, has to deal. Has to, I've seen you deal 15 plus damage. That doesn't necessarily mean LeBlanc has to do 15 plus damage, but LeBlanc has to be in play and you deal 15 plus damage from any sources. Um, you know, it could be a thermogenic beam for 10 and a, and a LeBlanc attack for five, for example. Um, but you know, so once once you uh, have that 15, LeBlanc levels up. Our leveled up LeBlanc is now gets the plus one plus one, so it's a six three with the quick attack. And then each time I see you deal 15 plus damage, so that means once it's leveled up, you have to do an additional 15 plus damage to then create a mirror image in hand. But if you already have a mirror image in hand that you already created before from a LeBlanc and you haven't cast it yet, 
then you just reduce its cost by one. Just like, you know, like whenever you hit with Zoe, you make the super cool star chart. And then if you hit with Zoe again, instead of making a second super cool star chart, you just reduce the cost by one. So mirror image is not a card that you can just put in your deck, unlike super cool star chart. Um, and it's just, it's only two mana and slow speed. So kind of assume that you would already have uh, played this card by the time you deal another 15 damage, but it's two mana slow speed and you summon an exact ephemeral copy of an ally with five plus power. Eh, not like the best spell, but it is something. So it's kind of like Dawn and Dusk, where, but Dawn and Dusk costs six mana and you make two copies. This is two mana and you make one copy but it can only be of an ally with five plus power. So you can't even use this on like a leveled up Teemo that's like a two, two, right? Like where Dawn and Dusk, you can use it on anything. You can only use it on um, allies with five plus power. So not really that good of a, a spell. It's, it's, it can finish games though, right? Like if you put it, you know, the, the thinking here is you put it on your LeBlanc and you get an additional LeBlanc attacking, um, you know, and it's an exact copy. So if you're able to give, Le if you cast like Might first on LeBlanc and you give LeBlanc Overwhelm, then you know your your other copy would have Overwhelm also. Um, but it's it's slow speed. It's it's kind of asking a lot there. Um. So there, uh. So I don't know. So that that's not like the best thing. But basically, LeBlanc is going to be kind of like Silver, where it doesn't really matter with the level up. We're talking about a 5-2 quick attack for 3 mana, and that's a really solid card, right? We have Senna right now as a 4-2 quick attack for 3 mana. Senna is difficult to deal with, right? Like attacking with Senna, that kills people pretty quickly. It's hard to block. Think if Senna had an additional point of power, if it was 5 power. That's pretty awesome. The thing about this card, I've... So I think this is a, a solid card, but I have seen people... Uh, not uh kind of disappointed with this card um online just like other stream viewers and stuff people have been disappointed thinking that they're hoping that leblanc was going to have you know maybe some more um just just some more uh, actions and you know like maybe just does like some some cool things instead of just being a big attacker you know thinking uh like how it has like this mirror image like usually i guess leblanc is supposed to have some cool trickery type stuff um and unfortunately, this card doesn't. It's just a, a really nice attacker. I And so I, I can understand that. I can understand people being disappointed about that. I'm also a little confused of why this is... So we're talking about a three... Like why this was printed as is. Because think about how LeBlanc is a three mana Noxus champion that attacks really, really well. Doesn't really block very well. But it's just... It's a three mana champion that's great at attacking. Well, you have... Draven is a Noxus three mana champion that's great at attacking. You don't really want to block with. Hmm. Kind of same kind of thing. You have Riven. That's a three mana Noxus champion that's great at attacking. Um, you don't. I mean, you can block with Riven a little bit more than the others, but you know, it's it really just cares about you attacking. You have Katarina. That's a three mana Noxus champion that just really cares about attacking. You know, again, has quick attack like LeBlanc and Draven. Riven doesn't start with quick attack, but it creates the um, blade fragments that can give it quick attack. So I think so. It's it's kind of weird that like that's what most of the Noxus champions are just three mana champions already that have quick attack and just care about you attacking. And so it's really weird that that LeBlanc is printed when you you think that that design space is already pretty taken up. Like you you can already build decks with multiple Noxus champions at three mana that have quick attack and just want you to attack. So that's that's the disappointing part to me is that it's just kind of the same design space, right? LeBlanc and Draven kind of have the same design space, and then even like Riven and and Katarina to some extent are pretty similar. So you would uh, so that's that's what I'm kind of disappointed with as far as it goes. That I was hoping for something a little bit different um, in that respect. But overall, as a card, just looking at the card. It's going to be solid. It's going to uh, play pretty well, even though it dies to Mystic Shot. It's going to play pretty well. It, I think this is, you can kind of compare this to like Zed, how Zed's like a 3-2 quick attack that brings another 3-2 quick attack. It's like you put those together, you have your 5-2 quick attack in one body. You know, maybe not as strong as Zed, but, you know, still similar to that. It's going to um, be really uh, difficult to deal with. But this this is, you know, should work out really well with cards like Might and Kato the Arm and things like that that like increase the power and give it overwhelm also. Plus all these like reputation cards and things like that. 
So we're, uh, oh, champion spell. So our champion spell is this Sigil of Malice. Um, four mana fast. Um, it does have that reputation. We just we talked about reputation a little er, you know earlier with uh, Sivir, how that's going to be difficult to pull off with reputation. But if you're able to, um, then it only costs one mana instead of four. That's a huge cost reduction. Again, reducing the cost by three here, and it deals deal two to anything. All right, so that's Mystic Shot. So it's four mana Mystic Shot, which that's really bad. But if you have reputation, now it's one mana Mystic Shot, which is really good. So it's, you know, it's that kind of thing. But if you, sometimes you got to spend four mana to kill a Twisted Fate, right? Like sometimes you just got to do it, even though it's a lot of mana. So it's still a, a, for a champion spell, it's maybe not something that you put in your deck normally, but for a champion spell, not bad because uh, you want your champion spells to be useful and a removal spell is always useful and Mystic Shot's always useful. So LeBlanc's going to go ahead and move on up to the B tier chilling with Rennington. Um, nothing, again, not not flashy. We were kind of hoping for um, LeBlanc to actually kind of be a little bit more interesting or, you know, have some some more effects than just another three-mana Noxus champion that attacks for a lot. But it's not a bad champion, and, and, and it's going to um, attack very efficiently. And then it, it does pair well with all these new reputation cards and also with cards like Trifarian Assessor and... Um, and uh, the Reckoning, um, some other already car Noxus cards that existed that cared about five power cards. So it, it fits well there, right? Like like Draven doesn't really fit well with Reckoning, but LeBlanc fits well with Reckoning, for example. Okay, uh, let's see. So we got one more. And our last champion that was just previewed today, just a little while ago, was Azir. Azir is the third of the Ascended Champions, as we talked about before, whenever we went talked about Rennington. Azir is the cheapest one. It's three mana. It's only a 1-5. Um, and it has an ability that when allies attack, summon an attacking Sand Soldier. So that's kind of like, so it's whenever any of your allies attack. So think about like Misfortune as a three mana champion. Whenever you attack with Misfortune, you get like that ability that Misfortune has. This one, this ability is summoning a Sand Soldier. And Sand Soldiers are going to be a big part of this new set. Sand Soldier is an ephemeral 1-1. One, one, and if, if it does strike the Nexus, you deal an additional point of damage to the enemy Nexus. So you can kind of think of this like Shark Chariot, right? Like, so whenever... Uh, whenever you attack, you get this extra little 1-1. One, one, uh, Nexus Strike, deal 1 to the enemy Nexus. There's a lot of ways to get Sand Soldiers. Sand Soldiers, like I said, are going to be a big part. Think of cards like this Dune Keeper. is a 1-man 2-1 one one that puts a Sand Soldier into play. You know, with the Femoral, you get to attack with that. Um, sand Crafter makes those Sand Soldiers every time it attacks. Um, lots, lots of different cards here that have to deal with Sand Soldiers, including Desert's Wrath is a slow spell for 4 mana, that you grant all of your allied sand soldiers everywhere plus one plus zero, and you also summon two sand soldiers um, whenever you play this. So this is a, a way to permanently buff your sand soldiers everywhere. Um, so lots lots of sand soldier type cards in this set. So basically, what that means is that you know the attacking sand soldiers are, are really good. To, you know you can swarm your opponent with sand soldiers. But that's also going to mean that it's going to be pretty easy to summon 10 plus units to level up your Azir. This is going to be the easiest of the three Ascended units to level up. And of course, we know that whenever you level up your Ascended units, you advance your Sun Disk 10. And so like you do, you know, you get 10, just any kind of uh, units at all that you summoned, you level up Azir. All right, now we have our leveled up Azir. So now it's a 2-6, again for 3 mana, so a large body. When allies attack, summon an attacking Sand Soldier, right? Like that that ability is still there. Still good to make that Sand Soldier. And now whenever you summon an ally, you give us both plus 1, plus 0 this round. So whenever you attack, you summon the Sand Soldier. Now the Sand Soldier is a 2-1 that's attacking. Plus, your Azor is now a 3-6. It gets the plus 1, plus 0 also. So they, they get a... Um, buff for that round so if you have a leveled up a zero in play you can play like a two drop you can cast like a two drop it has plus one plus zero and so does a zero 
cast a three drop. Now it also has plus one plus zero. So does Azir. Now you attack with those and now you make a sand soldier. Now it also gives you a zero plus one plus zero, right? So now you're a zero that looks like a two six could suddenly be like a five six that turn, right? Like, so this is going to be able to uh, buff Azir pretty um, easily, right? Summoning allies is very, is not difficult. These sand soldiers are ephemeral attackers also. And if we have all these ephemeral attackers, they pair really well with shark chariots where, you know, whenever you, you have your shark chariot coming in, that gets the plus one plus zero. And so does Azir and also cards like Hecarim. Um, so, you know, like we may be playing like Azir with like Shadow Isles with that kind of stuff. If you have like a Blighted Caretaker, um, that can be like three summons there to grow your Azir. And then also those um, with the Blighted Caretaker, those uh, saplings that you make those getting the plus one plus zero could be really nice also, making those larger challengers. So Azir looks looks pretty nice here. It looks to have a lot of synergy with just summoning units and attacking. And there's a lot of different, you know, besides Shadow Isles, you can pair it, you can say that with any region that wants to summon units and attack. That's pretty awesome. There's also just some of these, um, some of these cards that were uh, printed immediately that we didn't really think too much about maybe ends up being much better with Azir. Something like this card, this Voice of the Risen. Whenever this was printed, we didn't really think too much of this. But it, as you see, it says, when if you've leveled a champion, which we've talked about how that's not too difficult to level up in Azir if we're attacking with all these Sand Soldiers, then all of your allies have plus two, plus zero. So that means your Sand Soldier, or if you're playing Shark Chariot, <laughs> you know, those also, those will all have plus two, plus zero. Now your Sand Soldiers are three ones, your Shark Chariots are, are five ones, and then of course they even get the they get even additional buffs with your um, with your Azir ability here also. So we you can start attacking for a ton of damage with Azir um, and that card. So uh, this is looking pretty spicy. It looks like we can we can make some cool stuff to go along with Azir here. Um, and then we we talked about how it's kind of difficult to restore the sun disc but if you get to restore the sun disc you know uh, as we uh, talked about before then whenever you have your uh, level three azir uh, this is absolutely crazy when i level up replace your deck with the emperor's deck and then you get to draw an additional card so that's right your entire deck just get rid of it you don't need it anymore we we got a better deck for you, right? <laughs> you just get to replace it with the Emperor's deck. Wow. All right. So what is the Emperor's deck? All right. So as far as I know, and you know, could be wrong here, but as far as I know, the Emperor's deck is filled with these cards here that don't have any mana symbol down here. Like they don't have a rarity symbol because they're not like cards that you could just normally put in your deck. So your your um. Your Emperor's deck would look like this. It would have like Crumbling Sands, uh, four mana, fast speed, obliterate an enemy follower and draw a card. It's four mana, just obliterate something, draw a card. This card is crazy. Two mana, five, four, fearsome that you also just draw a card. Like that's incredible. There are just some really silly cards in here. A couple more that I want to point out are these two. Um, we'll go with this one first. Sandstorm. Nine mana, obliterate three enemy units or landmarks. Think about how powerful the nine mana celestial card is that you obliterate two things. Well, you know what? Let's make it so you don't have to behold anything to be able to cast it. And also let's make that three, just obliterate three enemy units or landmarks. Wow, Sandstorm incredible. But really this is the finisher. When you get the Emperor's deck, this is the card that just ends the game on the spot. 10 mana, Ascendance Call. You get to rally. Right. If you don't have the attack token, let's give it to you. All right, rally. And then you also summon Renekton and Gnosis, both of them. You don't have to have them in your deck because, of course, you replaced your deck anyway. Um, but it just summons th those two and immediately levels them up to level three. So immediately you will have a level three. Let's kind of scroll down a little bit to get to them. Do, 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 do. You'll have your level three Gnosis that is, of course, starts at a 10-10 gets plus one plus one for everything that you've slain has spell shield has fearsome has all of your overwhelms get minus three minus zero and your level three um renekton that again starts as a 10 10 has overwhelm and then whenever it blocks or attacks you get an anivia ability wow get both of those into play for 10 mana and rally <laughs> 
Because, you know, why not? Let's get some attacks in there. So that should just end the game right away on the spot. Um, but yeah, then there's there's some other cool cards. Your two mana, burst speed, draw two, um, help you get to that and everything. So just replace your deck with the Emperor's deck. That sounds pretty crazy, but also pretty awesome. <laughs> So I don't, yeah, is is the Emperor deck 40 cards? I don't know. I don't know exactly what, what it is. I just, I, I assume, it, you know, like it entails like these kind of cards that are insanely powerful, but I don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, that's something that, that's what we're going to be doing on day one for sure. We're going to be trying Azir with, um, and just like all, uh, all Sharima deck with Azir, Renekton, maybe Gnosis, maybe not, haven't determined that one yet, but we're going to be trying to restore this Sun Disk playing this Ascendant's Rise, um, you know, getting a bunch of, of Sand Soldiers out. This this seems like this will be a lot of fun to do and, and very powerful. And then you have your, your I don't think I really talked about this card, but your um, Allegiance card for going all um, Sharima to start with your Sun Disk in your hand. Your Allegiance card is awesome here. You know, all your Allegiance cards are four mana. For Gold Ambassador, it's a 3-2, and if you hit your Allegiance, which you will, draw a champion and grant it plus two plus two <laughs> think about like pnz pnz their allegiance card you get to create a zero mana sumpworks map now would you rather have a zero mana sumpworks map which is also only zero for like one turn right like so it's it's a sumpworks map that only costs zero for a turn but then otherwise it's just a regular sumpworks map or would you rather just be able to draw a champion and grant it plus two plus two <laughs> like that's not like come on poor pnz um <clears throat> hey that's that's cool dynamito brings up a good point there also that it's also easier to play these allegiance cards with um and and especially like that kind of card if you're playing sharima sharima should be easier to hit allegiance because you have some you could play these predict cards if you want to play these cards with predict this is a keyword that i didn't really talk about there's a two mana two three with predict what predict means is you you look at three cards in your deck, three random cards in your deck. So it's like invoke, right? You look at three of them and you and you choose which one to put on top of your deck and you shuffle the rest. And so you, you basically get to, to help choose what's going to be your next draw step, what's going to be on top of your deck. Well, Allegiance checks what's on top of your deck. So for six mana, you could play this Chronomancer, predict, take it, you know, find look at three, find which one's the Sharima card, put it on top. You know, so you guarantee that you're going to hit, that you have a Sharima card on, on top, and now spend four mana, play this Golden Ambassador, boom, you hit your Allegiance, draw your champion, grant it, plus two, plus two. So that's that's pretty cool there, too. Um, so yeah, so that, that's going to be a lot of fun. That's what we're going to be trying right away. We're going to be trying to level up these Ascended Allies. This, this Sun Disk looks pretty sweet, and these level three champions look incredible. And there's Azir, level three, just... What's your deck? Don't worry about it. Get rid of it. Replace it with the Emperor's deck. Also, one other thing about this. Um, so, you know, you, you think, okay, my my um, my deck's just replaced. So that's not cool. I, I wanted to, like, draw my champions and stuff like that. Well, remember, to, to level up, to get to level three with Azir, you had to have restored the Sun Disk. And when you do restore the Sun Disk, if uh, you forgot about this, let's get to our Sun Disk. Do, 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 do. When you restore the Sun Disk, the first thing you do is you immediately draw one of all of your Ascendants, right? So your champions that you have in your deck, you immediately draw one of all of them first. And then now, um, now we go to level three. Now replace your deck with the new cool Emperor's deck. But you're in your hand, you now have, you know, one of all of your Ascendants. You now, um, you know, you don't have to worry about your, your entire deck getting replaced and you don't have champions anymore. Boom, you get your champions again. So that's that's uh, um, so that will be uh, really convenient as well. As far as a champion spell for Azir, it the champion spell is Arise, um, which is not honestly the best champion spell. Um, but this is a way to you know, like if you have Azir in play, leveled up, that replaced your deck, you drew another Azir from your Sun Disk. You can cast this champion spell and put an additional Azir back into your deck if you would like. All right, but anyway, um, it's it's kind of like Vi's champion spell. You know, Vi's 
with the give plus two plus zero, get a fleeting card, plus two plus zero, you know, select that three mana. It's like that, except for you just make a sand soldier. And then it has, you create your fleeting arise in hand. You, so you can spend multiple mana making multiple sand soldiers. It's all right. Not bad. You know, it's definitely a champion spell. Definitely not something you're putting into your deck. Just like Vi's champion spell, you're not putting that into your deck either. But it will be useful at times. All in all, um, Azir looks pretty cool. It's not like it's not like one of the best champions, though, right? Like, it's, it doesn't have any, like, keywords on it. Um, it also is you know, not a very, not very threatening being one power to start with. Um, but it still has a ton of potential and everything. Um, uh, we're putting a zero. We're kind of thinking either between a and B tier with We're, th we're going to start with a zero on the B tier because that's where we ended up with, but maybe a zero should be up in the A tier there. Um, you know, those it's, it's kind of one of those. It's probably not an S tier champion, uh, considering it doesn't do a ton on its own, right? Like if you don't have like other units in play and you play a Zir and it's just like your one five, you're not going to really want to attack with it to get your sand, you know, right? Like it, you're, you're going to need your other cards alongside with it, but it has a really, really powerful late game. It levels up fairly easily. It has a lot of cool stuff with it, but we're going to put it over on the, uh, B tier for now. So there we go. There's our, our tier list with our nine new champions. Um, we're going to have um, Lissandra and Kindred on the S tier. We're going to have Jarvan and Sivir on the A tier. Rennington, um, LeBlanc, Azir, B tier. And then uh, over for C tier, we got um, uh, Nasus and Talia. Um, and and as we talked about, Talia is going to be one that's, where's Talia? Talia is going to be one that's going to be really difficult to, um, you know, predict. Like this, this is going to be one that's going to be, we're, we're going to have to try this out and really see what this, uh, how this plays. But there we go. I'm excited for all the champions. You're going to see all of these champions here in the next few days on stream. We're definitely playing decks. Probably our next nine decks will be like one, one with like each champion kind of thing. We're going to have to do all sorts of combinations with, with all the champions. We're playing them all. Um, that's for sure. And then we all will have like all sorts of old champions to combine with these new champions. That's what we're going to be doing for like the next week. We got lots of, uh, new decks to play with all of them. Plus this, ex this expansion just looks really fun. So like, there's none of these champions look like really incredibly overpowering, like an Aphelios or a Twisted Fate that just like, just generates tons and tons of value and gives you lots of card selection and all that kind of stuff. These all look like much better and more fun champions to play with and against. Plus this expansion has a ton of really cool looking meme tier cards. Um, you know, summon two Legion Marauders. We're going to have a lot of cool stuff to, uh, to have for our meme tier decks. So that's going to, this is going to be an exciting, um, really an exciting expansion to brew with and make new decks. So, uh, can't wait. We're going to have that tomorrow. Um, and there we go. All right. So those of y'all watching later on YouTube, hit that like button, leave those comments. What are you excited about? What do you want me to play? Um, you know, what, which like champion combinations do you want to see? You know, uh, that kind of stuff. What, what do you want me to build? Um, what are you excited to play? What are you going to be building? Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Let me, you know, let me know. Let's, let's get this hype going, but that's it here for our, um, champion preview for the emperors of ascended expansion that's coming out tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for watching everybody. I can't, can't say enough. I really appreciate it. And I will see you for the next video.